Today's video is brought to you by a brand new sponsor called Zbiotics, and I think you guys are going to like what they're offering quite a bit. Look, tell me if this sounds like a familiar scenario. Have you ever gone out, happy hour, cocktails, co-workers, and it's, you know, Tuesday, <laughs> then you go home, you wake up the next day, and it's absolutely awful because you're just not feeling your best, are you? How was that fifth cocktail? How was it? Look, it's no fun. We've all been there. But fortunately, there is now Zbiotics, which is the first genetically engineered probiotic in the world. Like, the first ever and it helps you feel better the next day. Here's the deal. You buy some Zbiotics and you drink it before you consume any alcohol and then you wake up the next day and you feel good. And that's about it. And look, that's because Zbiotics is a probiotic that breaks down the byproduct of alcohol, which is the thing that's most responsible for rough mornings after drinking. That everybody thinks is dehydration, but it's not. There's a toxic byproduct of alcohol that builds up in your gut, and Zbiotics produces an enzyme, sort of like what your liver does, to help counteract this byproduct. Now, look, before you go and buy 57 bottles of this, because of course you would, it's important to understand that Zbiotics cannot help you sober up and it can't make you blissfully well rested if you only slept for three hours. It is not magic, it is science. But like I said, it does do a great job of getting rid of those nasty byproducts in your system because of, well, honest to goodness, science. You guys can get 15% of your first order by going to zbiotics.com slash sideprojects. That's zbiotics.com slash sideprojects. Or just follow the link in the description below and use my code sideprojects at checkout. Enjoy your drinks, enjoy Zbiotics, and now today's video. Our understanding of the universe has improved dramatically over the last century. However, every question answered seems to result in dozens of new questions that we have no idea how to tackle. According to legend, famed physicist Richard Feynman once said, anyone who claims to understand quantum theory is either lying or crazy. From the tiniest subatomic particles to massive clusters of galaxies, the universe is overflowing with questions that we may never have answers for. So today, we're going to look at five such mysteries. Approximately 13.8 billion years ago, all the energy in the universe was condensed into a single point with essentially infinite density. All of this energy then exploded with such incredible force that it created matter, which then expanded outward, forming billions or likely even hundreds of billions of galaxies. From this single point of energy, the entire universe was born. But what triggered that to happen? The honest answer is, we have absolutely no idea. Originally, the prevailing theory was that the universe was cyclical in nature. There was a big bang that led to a rapid expansion of the universe, and then things would cool off and start to collapse back in on itself until the entire universe was back to a single point of infinite density. Then just bother, rinse, and repeat. However, this theory has fallen out of favor, and most cosmologists believe the universe will just continue its outward expansion forever. Since then, there have been a lot of guesses as to what caused the Big Bang. For example, one proposal suggests that our universe's empty four-dimensional space-time collided in some higher dimension with another universe, and this jostle triggered the Big Bang to fill out all that previously empty space-time. Now, if that sounds complicated, well, the ideas only get even more intense. Another suggestion is that the Big Bang could have created two universes at the same time. There's the universe that we currently live in, with time seeming to flow forward. But at the point of the Big Bang, a second universe could have been formed within the same space-time, but with time flowing in the opposite direction to us. The issue with all of these hypotheses is that we don't know what's right, and uh, we likely never will. For all intents and purposes, the precise moment the Big Bang started is t equals zero for the universe. Looking at light from distant sources is like looking into the past, but with our best technology, we are only able to see back as far as about 380,000 years after the Big Bang. Utilizing that information, we have a pretty good guess as to how the events of the Big Bang transpired, all the way back to just after the Big Bang happens. But before that, it's anybody's guess. Ultimately, the Big Bang was such a massively transformative event that it would have erased any evidence of what existed before, which includes any evidence of what could have triggered it. As is the case with many of the bigger mysteries of the universe, not only do we have no clue what the answer is, we have no idea how we'd even try to figure it out. If an answer could ever be found, our current science is almost certainly centuries away from it, if not even longer.
Hopefully, this comes as no surprise to you, but the universe is comprised of matter. The three subatomic particles most people learn about are negatively charged electrons, positively charged protons, and neutrons, which carry no charge. However, those are only the subatomic particles of matter. There are also the antimatter particles, positrons, antiprotons, and antineutrons. These three particles are identical to their matter counterparts, except they have the opposite charge. There are some other properties that are reversed as well, but charge is the big one. When matter and antimatter come into contact with one another, they are immediately destroyed and turned into energy. Given the volatile nature of matter and antimatter, they obviously can't coexist, so it makes sense that the universe would be made up entirely of matter. Right? Well, actually, it doesn't make any sense that the universe exists at all. According to the Big Bang Theory, an equal amount of both matter and antimatter would have been created. As these particles came into contact with one another, they would have been destroyed and turned into energy. This means no stars, no planets, no nothing. Now, obviously, that didn't happen. Here we all are. But the question is, why? Why wasn't both all matter and antimatter destroyed, and why did matter win out? Well, according to the standard model, the prevailing theory in particle physics, there's no reason anything should exist. This means our understanding of physics is just nowhere near complete. Until the 1960s, it was believed that matter and antimatter were symmetrical in every way. A negative charge in matter may be a positive charge in the antimatter equivalent, but the absolute values of all things pertaining to these particles was thought to be identical. However, in 1964, researchers discovered a tiny discrepancy in the way that kaons and antikaons decayed. Some other discrepancies have been found as well, but we cannot emphasize enough just how tiny these variations are. Nothing has been found in these discrepancies that would violate the standard model, and certainly not to the extent it would provide an explanation for why the universe is comprised solely of matter. There are some proposed alterations to the standard model that hope to fill in some of the gaps in our understanding. Likely, the most prominent proposal is supersymmetry. With any luck, the new and improved Large Hadron Collider can help fill some of the holes in our knowledge of subatomic particles. According to scientific folklore, Enrico Fermi, creator of the first nuclear reactor, was discussing UFO reports with his fellow physicists while walking to lunch. They were all unsurprisingly of the belief that none of the reports of UFOs were real, but Fermi loudly blurted out, Where is everybody? which the others immediately understood to mean extraterrestrials. We know this conversation happens, though the exact details are not clear. Fermi's outburst resulted in the observation being named the Fermi Paradox. The paradox stems from the lack of evidence of any extraterrestrial life in contrast to the high estimates for the probability that life should exist on other planets. To try and find a more concrete solution to this problem, astronomer and astrophysicist Frank Drake put forth the Drake Equation in 1961 to try to quantify exactly how many alien civilizations should exist. The Drake Equation calculates the number of civilizations that should exist by multiplying seven factors together. The rate of formation of stars in the galaxy, the fraction of those stars with planetary systems, the number of planets per solar system with an environment suitable for organic life, the fraction of those planets where on organic organic life actually appears, the fraction of habitable planets whereupon intelligent life actually appears, the fraction of civilizations that reach the technological level whereby detectable signals may be dispatched, and the length of time those civilizations dispatch their signals. Now, you probably picked up on this, but those last four factors are completely unknown. We've found a lot of planets that are suitable for organic life, but we have yet to find any more organic life itself. As such, all we can do is guess at those last four factors. Optimists have used the Drake Equation to assert that there should be anywhere from 1,000 to 1 million civilizations in the Milky Way galaxy alone, while pessimists have used it to claim that the number of civilizations per galaxy should be less than one. Most people, scientists and laymen alike, agree that there should be other intelligent life somewhere in the universe. The mediocrity principle says that if an item is chosen at random from a set of objects, the random item is most likely going to be an average example. In this case, the set of objects is planets that are suitable for life, and the item randomly chosen is Earth. Logically, our planet should be average amongst all potentially habitable planets, so why have we detected no signs of life anywhere in the universe. Now, there are several hypothetical explanations for Fermi's paradox. One is the rare Earth hypothesis, which simply throws away the mediocrity principle and says that Earth is pretty dang special. It argues that the conditions required for life to evolve are exceedingly rare and 
we just got really, really lucky. A similar proposal is that even if complex life is extremely common, intelligent life may not be. Life has existed on this planet for 3.7 billion years, and of all the various forms of life that had existed, including across multiple mass extinction events, we humans are the only ones that evolved into a spacefaring species. And speaking of mass extinction events, Earth has had five of them. If life previously existed on other planets, there's no reason to believe that they could not have been subject to such global catastrophes. Homo sapiens have only existed for about 300,000 years, and the oldest human ancestors were only 2.5 million years ago. Compared to the 3.7 billion years of life on Earth or the 13.8 billion years the universe has existed, that's not a lot of time. It's possible other intelligent life has existed in relative proximity to Earth and we just missed it by a billion years or so. There are a lot of possible explanations for why we haven't detected any intelligent life, but at the same time, it's also a numbers game. In the Milky Way galaxy alone, there is anywhere from 300 million to 6 billion Earth-like planets, and there are as many as 200 billion galaxies in the universe. So, what are the odds of life forming on an Earth-like planet. A billion to one? A trillion to one? Even if the odds were a quadrillion to one, that would still mean over a billion planets across the universe should be home to intelligent life. Again, seriously, where are all the aliens? The universe is made up of mass energy, a combination of mass and energy, which are essentially interchangeable. However, the ordinary matter and energy that make up our universe only account for about 4.5% of the total mass energy of the universe. So, well, where is the rest? It's believed that a hypothetical form of matter known as dark matter makes up 27% of the total mass energy and a staggering 85% of the total mass of the universe. It is everywhere, roughly six times more abundant than normal observable matter. The only thing is, we can't see it. Dark matter gets its name because the particles don't interact with the electromagnetic field, meaning that they don't absorb, reflect, or emit electromagnetic radiation, including light. This makes detecting dark matter extremely difficult. In fact, we can't detect it at all. Thus far, we have only implied that it exists. Under the standard model, which does not incorporate dark matter, it's not actually possible for many galaxies to have formed, including our own. There simply should not have been enough gravity to collect the amount of matter that it did. Some galaxies still would have formed without dark matter, but they should be behaving much differently than they do. Galaxies tend to move and rotate much faster than they should based on observable matter. The universe is full of strange gravitational phenomena that scientists can't explain without the existence of dark matter, which provides a fairly strong case for its existence. It is believed that there must be some previously undiscovered elementary particle that makes up dark matter, the top candidates being weakly interacting massive particles or WIMPs. Though this is all theoretical. One of the potential goals of the Large Hadron Collider is to detect dark matter particles. This is yet to happen, but that's far from conclusive. Has the LHC failed to detect dark matter particles because there haven't been any, or because they're impossible to detect? These particles would not be detectable by ordinary means, meaning that we have to rely on indirect means that imply its existence. It's almost like trying to prove the existence of ghosts, except that these ghosts have massive gravitational effects, without which the universe wouldn't make any sense. Now, if you were paying attention earlier in the video, you'd have noticed that we mentioned that dark matter makes up 85% of the mass of the universe, but only 27% of the total mass energy. Now, ordinarily, mass energy only makes up about 5%. So, well, what about the rest? What's the remaining 68% of mass energy in the universe? Dark energy makes up the remaining 68% of the mass energy of the universe, and it is, well, we don't have the slightest clue what it is. Dark energy is essentially just a catchy placeholder name to go alongside dark matter. We may not have discovered dark matter particles, but scientists have a pretty good idea what they should be, and even some ideas on how they could potentially prove the existence of these invisible particles. Dark energy, on the other hand, is really just anybody's guess. We mentioned earlier that it was previously believed the universe would eventually cool off and collapse back in on itself. Barring that, it was thought that all the matter in the universe would get too spread out and the expansion of the universe would slow down and stop due to the lack of gravitational forces. These were reasonable assumptions based on the standard model. But they weren't just slightly wrong, they were the exact opposite of what was happening. 
Despite everything that scientists would have expected, not only is the universe still expanding, but the expansion is accelerating, not slowing down. We can calculate how much dark energy there has to be because of the way it's affecting the expansion of the universe, but well, that's about it. We don't know what it is or where it came from. The vastness of the universe is pretty difficult for our minds to comprehend, especially the idea that the universe, which is everything, is somehow able to expand. If the universe is everything, well, what's it expanding into, and is there an infinite amount of space-time in all directions? One theory from Albert Einstein is that space is not infinite in all directions, but more space can come into existence. When this happens, the space isn't empty. It instead carries with it energy known as the cosmological constant. But why would this energy be there? And why would it be as powerful as it is? Essentially, dark energy is just the term that scientists made up for this thing that we can't explain, but we need to use in order to rationalize this other thing that we can't explain. They could just as easily have named it Zeus, which would probably be a better indicator of exactly how little we know about 95% of the mass energy of the universe.